Tonight on The Big Debate, is history becoming history? Hello, it's always been one of the cornerstones of the curriculum, but according to some surveys, less than a third of pupils study history at GCSE, and a top government advisor has suggested phasing it out as a discrete subject altogether at primary level. But is interest in history really on the wane, or is it the way it's being taught that's the problem? Remembrance Sunday remains as powerful as ever in the national consciousness, but do our schools teach the full story of what it is we're remembering? With me to discuss all of this, the schools minister, Ian Wright, the historian and writer, Lisa Hilton, teacher and expert on Black History Month, Leslie Wills, the Conservative Education spokesman, Nick Gibb, and the Deputy General Secretary of the ASCL, Martin Ward. We've also brought together an audience of teachers, experts, parents and pupils for today's big debate. Let's get some opening thoughts from our panel on why we have this problem, why there seems to be a decline in the, in, in, in the, in the numbers of pupils choosing to study history as they, as they get older. Nick Gibb, let me begin with you, um, Conservative Education spokesman. Why do you think we've got a problem? Well, a combination of a move towards softer GCSE options as people chase the targets the government have set schools, but also the way the curriculum has moved away from a narrative study of history with all the knowledge and stories of our wonderful British history and European and, and world history. And I'm afraid that has put off uh, a number of students from taking the subject. Ian Wright. There's no evidence, actually, Krishnan, that history is in decline. We've seen around about 200,000 students each year for the last 15 years take GCSE history and actually the numbers of A-level students have increased to an all-time high. So the idea that history is dead is simply wrong. History in the classroom is going from strength to strength. Uh, Lisa Hilton, do we have a problem? If so, why? Uh, yeah, as I understand it, there's been a 4.5% decline in students taking GCSE history between 1997 and 2007 as compared with an 11% augmentation in the independent sector. I think if those statistics are correct, possibly the reason is that history is perceived increasingly as an elitist subject, something which is too difficult for the majority of children to pursue. OK, well, that's a big, big one to tackle later on. Le Leslie Wills, what's your perspective on this? I mean, w what is the problem in terms of enticing students into history? Well, as long as we use statements like British narrative history or engage with only British colonial history, lots of people are turned off. People are passionate about things that have to do with themselves. People's learning involves self as a starting point. So history that's broad-based, that's inclusive, that acknowledges different strands of humanity is the history that people are very interested in. And Martin Ward, is there a problem and why? Well, I certainly hope that there isn't. I think that history is a subject that everybody ought to be learning. Uh, as far as I can tell, the, the number of students taking GCSE history has stayed more or less uh, constant. Um, but obviously there's a great deal of interest in history in the, the population at, at large, and that isn't entirely reflected in the take-up of history in, in our schools. So I think we, it is something that we need to be looking at and working out why it is that we haven't got a still larger group of, of people taking history and going on with that wonderful study. OK, well, th thank you for that. That's a flavour of the views of our panel today. But is it really a problem if only a minority of GCSE-level students are studying history? It's been said that those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. But is the study of our past becoming a thing of the past? Fewer pupils are choosing to study history at GCSE, and recent reports suggest many children receive little or no history education by Key Stage 3. So what's the problem? Are they bored by Hitler and the Henrys, an endless list of important dates, or are schools discouraging pupils from studying the subject for fear of plunging to the bottom of performance league tables? With all primary schools set to teach subjects thematically by 2011, would it matter if history disappeared as a discrete subject altogether and merged with geography or science? Or would a change of government lead to a more traditional approach? 
The Shadow Children's Secretary, Michael Gove, has already suggested a need to teach what he calls the proper narratives of British history. But what exactly does that mean? And where does Black History Month fit in? Do we risk being in danger of teaching an overly positive and patriotic version of our past? Most of us would agree that history can provide us with a sense of identity. It can aid us in understanding the society we live in. But whose history are we teaching? In order for the subject to teach us something valuable, we must first determine how it should be taught. Well, our panel disputed right away whether history was in decline. And some of the figures uh, that we quoted at the top there came from the Historical Association and Flora Wilson. Uh, you are our representative from there. So is history in decline or not? No, it isn't. That's the first thing to say. Um, we recently did a survey. Last year, we surveyed um, over 700 schools, um, secondary schools in Britain. And what we found from that survey was that it was a time of real excitement, real enthusiasm in schools about history. The new Key Stage 3 has given teachers a massive amount of flexibility to deliver a curriculum that teachers feel passionate about, which can engage their local populations because they can in include things that are relevant to them and their schools, as well as including the narratives that will, you know, inspire that passion amongst all those teachers. So a third of a third of students taking it at GCSE, that's kind of always been the case, isn't well, it? Well, the, the, um, there, there are issues, but it's not to do with the teaching necessarily. It's to do with the lack of safeguarding of time. The real concerns that we found <coughs> in the survey was that... Um, the time made available by schools for the, provision, for the teaching of history is being cut radically. So in 48% of academies, for example, um, 11 and 12 year olds get less than an hour a week doing history. In um, schools, there's an increasing trend to cut Key Stage 3 to two years, which means that some, some secondary school pupils only receive one year of compulsory Right, so history. less time is being spent on it, yeah. and, and fewer mm. students are taking it at GCSE. Because so the answer to is history in decline might be yes, but if you read it another way. Well, yes, <laughs> but th there's a direct correlation. We know that, people, that children choose their options because of prior achievement and prior... Um, excitement about the subject and history teachers are being forced into a position where because of um, s school decisions about key stage two, about curriculum time, about pathways for certain groups of students, they are being forced into a position where they cannot deliver what they need to deliver. Okay, Nick Gibb, th this is what you've been picking up on, you know, Michael Gobe was talking about it at your Conservative Party conference saying history is a failure uh, in terms of uh, education in, in England. I mean, what, you think it needs to be expanded or what? Well, it's very important because it does give people a, a modern, uh, informed view about Britain to understand the history of this country. And Professor Williams from Cardiff University set five very basic questions for his undergraduate history students. And one of those five questions was, name a 19th century prime minister. And only 11.5% got that question right. That is absurd. We cannot have a position where history students going to university don't even know the answer to that question. And you wonder, therefore, how many students who are not studying history know the name of a single 19th century prime minister. And this just demonstrates, and there are other questions I could give you to, to, that demonstrate the same thing. We can't have a position where people are leaving school after 11 or 13 years and they don't know some basic facts about our history. And I think that's what we've got to get back to, a narrative uh, study of history, knowing the big important stories of our history, of the American history, of Africa, of Europe. Children should leave school. Our history, those things. you mean, so everything, that's the world. Well, they should, know, they should certainly know the history of this country. <coughs> uh, but in addition to that, they should know the basic history of the countries that have influenced us okay. and have influenced our population. Ian Wright. Um, well, I agree with Nick that a sense of identity is very important and history can help us teach that. I think you don't know where you're going unless you know where you've come from. But I think history and the curriculum that we're providing, the framework that we're providing, is allowing us to do that. We're trying to free up teachers to teach in an exciting and innovative manner to really inspire and motivate pupils. And the evidence suggests that that's happening. As I said, history is not dead in schools. But there's a basic divide. You're talking about innovation. He's talking about old-style narrative history. Well, I think if you, if you want to sit down and learn by rote, I think that can put people off. I think it's very important to have the basics about wh when you know when the Battle of Agincourt, or the Battle of Bosworth, I think that can be important. But I think the sense of exciting and inspiring young people to get into history we in the first place is the great one. But the changes to the curriculum 
over the last 10 years or so have moved it away from being a study of the wonderful richness of, of the story, the kind of thing Lisa writes about, uh, and towards a more skills-based uh, approach, such as uh, data analysis or uh, you know, chronology. Uh, and that, I'm afraid, kills it. If, you d if you're in a classroom and say, well, today we're going to study chronology, uh, put these facts in chronological order, which Nick I've seen in one Nick lesson, you wrong. that will destroy any love of history. Whereas if they're told the wonderful stories of our history, over their 11 years of education. They will leave school knowing about this country and the important events of the world. Uh, they'll be better educated and they'll love the study of the subject. But you are wrong. The, uh, from 5 to 11, young people learn about the Romans, about the Anglo-Saxons, about the Vikings. They go on to learn about the Tudors. They can go and learn on about the Victorian era or Britain since 1930. This broad sweep of really exciting uh, periods I in our history is exactly what's been taught at a very early age. And we are trying to free up teachers to allow that real inspiration because History teachers are really passionate but about Jim the subject. Jim Rose talked about moving history to the secondary curriculum and scrapping it all together. Le Lisa school. Hilton, I mean, <laughs> um, give, give us some perspective here on this left-right um, argument. Well, I don't think perhaps it should be co-opted by either side. I don't think there's any kind of fundamental discrepancy between what Ian and Nick are saying. Um, I think that narrative context is essential for teaching of history, but perhaps um, in terms of a more old-fashioned narrative approach, it needs to be broader. We can't just teach Anglo-Saxons, then jump to the Tudors, and then jump to the Victorians, because actually that's very difficult for children to make sense Is this of. a real debate amongst history teachers and historians, or uh, is it a bit of a I think, sterile I think it's, one? It's, I think it's a huge debate in terms of, of, of historiography and, and how, um, how history is taught. I mean, there's, there's a big debate going on in academia at the moment about whether or not it's possible to teach history um, without teleology, without a sense of a sort of Whig narrative that, that concludes in, in some kind of s synthetic positivism. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily an issue for primary school history. Okay, let me bring in some people in, in the audience. Gentleman on the front row there. What worries me is that we've already heard the word narrative used in a sort of pejorative sense, we've heard, and, and indeed the word British used in a pejorative sense. But actually, um, if you can point out, one of the most um, passionate exponents of British history was the left-wing historian Rafe, Rafe Samuel died some years ago, because um, he saw that it was absolutely essential to, to have a narrative grasp of the history of the country you're living in and growing up in. And that, I'm sorry Ian, but you're wrong. That's not what comes out in primary schools, and it's not what comes out in secondary schools either. Because of the point that Flora was making about the, um, the pressure on time, and the absolutely ossified dinosaur of GCSE history, which hasn't changed in years. So that, th that is why you get students going through to university, which is where I'm now teaching, having been in schools, and it makes absolutely right that there is no broad knowledge into which they can fit the sort of history that they're going to be learning or that they have learned. OK, l let me bring in Andrew Foster. Where are you? Andrew, wh what's your perspective here? Well, my perspective is to ask, uh, should we, like most countries in Western Europe, ensure that more of our pupils get taught history beyond the age of 14. We're one of the few countries in Western Europe which stops. Well, as, as a compulsory thing, you, yeah. you, you must learn history up to GCSE. Well, not necessarily compulsory. We must do something to ensure we go beyond that. OK. Um, well, uh, Martin Ward, what would you say to that? I'm not sure that I like the idea of adding yet more compulsion. I have a, I have a feeling we have rather too much compulsion already. And what I would like to pick up on is that sense of freeing up, freeing up teachers to design a curriculum to, that makes sense for them and for their, for their students, the sort of thing that Flora was talking about. That's what will turn on the excitement. And then I think that that sort of debate as to whether we have themes, whether we have narratives, teachers can work that out for themselves perfectly well. I think the problem with the, the time element uh, and we, you know, we certainly need enough time to be spent on history so that our citizens actually have some notion of where, where they came from and where the countries come from. Uh, the problem with the time element is that the curriculum is so incredibly crowded. There are so many other things that schools have got to, to put in. Well, let and at will, every turn we seem to get something else shoehorned in. Nobody ever takes anything out. As, as a history teacher, I mean, how would you feel about making sure children have to learn beyond the age of 14? Well, if you're passionate about history, you should have a choice. But from what I've been hearing here, people are missing the point. The reason why they can't remember the prime minister and, and, and the various speak people that they've studied about is because <laughs> it is actually because this is someone else's history. This history is, as we know, the Marxist argument, class history, a very male history, a history that's excluding whole groups of people. 
So you're not going to remember things that are not relevant to you. Well, if you're, if you're, fine, if you're, if you're black or from an ethnic minority, right. fine. But what about the majority white English Anglo-Saxon population? Well, they're the ones that are leaving the curriculum in droves. According but to but they're the arguments. ones who also don't know who their prime ministers were in the 19th century. Well, that's because of the way people learn. And learning is now personal. People are interested in their own ancestry. They are interested in in personal histories, they're interested in local history, but they're not interested in dead men's history. Okay, well, you, 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 bring, us, in you, you bring us to an aspect <laughs> of this <laughs> discussion that, that, well, okay, let, let, there's a couple of people in the audience who want to come in. Yes, on the front row there, what do you want to say? Uh, yeah, I'm a school teacher in South London. I, I find what you've just said to be ridiculous. The whole, the confusion that you've pointed to is more of a kind of pseudo-philosophical confusion that where some people are saying narrative, some people are saying skills. But your whole approach to say that you start with the self means that you would only ever learn about yourself. The whole point about history is that it's universal, that it has an aspiration to the truth for everybody. I remember confronting some children in my school about why they wanted to do black history or not, and they did. And I said, well, I'd rather teach you about the Magna Carta because it has certain more fundamental truths to it that would help you in this country. The point is not that I was definitively right or they were definitively right. It's that we had a shared conversation about the truth as different as people who look different, adult to child, black to white, man to woman. Your attempt to differentiate so much uh, avoids the fact that we all have so much in common. That's what history does teach are us. Are you basically having a go at Black History Month, which we, we've, we've just finished? I believe that black history is, is bad history and bad social policy all rolled up together, and it ends up confusing more people more than it liberates their mind, which should be the aim of good history. Leslie? Well, my... That's very an interesting perspective. My own experience, I was born in England, I was sent to um, what used to be British Guyana in the Caribbean to go to school. And I went to a very British school and I studied British, European and Caribbean history. I loved history, I was passionate about it, I got a distinction. But it could have been because I was given the option of studying Caribbean history. My father loved British history, he was educated here as well when I was born. Now people will and do need to know the, about British history and the British narrative history, but they do also need to see where they are relevant and where they come in. You know, what is it? it I mean, I don't see how you could condemn Black History Month when people like myself have got uncles who fought in the war and great grandmothers from Britain and we were never taught about their input when we went to school. I Ian Wright, I mean, it's, it's quite a quite an accusation, isn't it? Sort of bad, bad, bad history and social engineering, effectively. Uh, to be honest, I don't think that the two views are mutually exclusive. I do agree with Leslie's point about we need to be inclusive. We need to, to make it relevant. And I think that's a key point. And I think that's true of learning and not just about history. Students want to see a relevance to things, and that will mean... Um, learning about their local area, learning about local dignitaries, dead men, for want of a better term, in that respect. But it's, it's, it's providing the tools to inspire and motivate and give people that love of history, as well as providing them with what I think is an important and fundamental grounding in the key points that have happened in their country's history. That's what we're doing with the curriculum. The lady in the purple. Um, I think this is kind of taking away from us as teachers what we are actually already doing in the classroom, which is now we've got this new national curriculum, we are making um, space in the history timetable to fit in black history, to fit in women history, and because we've been given more freedom with the national curriculum, we are doing much more world history, um, so therefore I think we are incorporating a lot of um, different people's history, we do local history, and we can fit that now into the national curriculum because it's there for us to do it and we've got that greater flexibility. And I think, you know, people dictating to us what we, ha we can and can't do is actually not giving us the credit for what we are actually already doing in the classroom. Lisa Hilton, I mean, people have to make choices, though, don't they? I mean, if you've only got a couple of hours yeah, to teach I, I in in a week. I think we've been talking a great deal about content, but we haven't really discussed why we all, I think, agree that history is so important. I mean, what's history actually for? Why do we think it's so essential? I think my own opinion is that you, you can't have any kind of vital democracy without history teaching. I think history is tremendously important if you want people to participate in democracy. You can't, I think as, as Ian said earlier, you can't vote for what you want to be unless you know who you are. 
So I think rather than um, emphasizing, you know, this aspect over this aspect or narrative over minority, whatever, you know, elements of the curriculum, um, as this lady pointed out, ought to be imposed, we ought to be perhaps discussing why history is so important and finding ways of pushing it back into the curriculum and giving it more space. Gentleman in the, uh, in the, in the brown suit. Um, yes, I'd like to pick up on the point that uh, Lisa was making, that um, I think that the, the most important thing to remember is that the origin of the word history is from the Greek inquiry, and that implies a very active um, investigative approach to history, and, and if it's taught in a very passive, um, I don't mean to use narrative in a pejorative term, but if, it, if it's taught passively, narratively, then children find that very um, unengaging. Whereas if they're given the opportunity to um, investigate uh, key questions, to direct their own learning, they become really engaged. Uh, a lot of the work that we do at the National Archives is around getting kids to work with real documents, work in the way that real historians right. work. Right, and to so, that, so that plays against old-fashioned narrative, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Well, I think, it, I think it can work with that approach. I think you have to have a chronological big picture so that you understand what's going on. So do you on. think Nick Gibbs trying to take us back to some past we don't want to go to? <laughs> um, no, I think um, having um, a, a big picture understanding is important, but it's got to be based around active inquiring history. Nick? Well, you know, 60% of these, I mean, I don't disagree with what you say, um, provided we don't lose this, you know, the bedrock of the historical knowledge. 60% of students starting at Cardiff University to study history didn't know the profession of Isambard Kingdom Brunel. I mean, I mean, it's these kind of things that really do worry policymakers, that we have this very expensive education system uh, and children are leaving, having studied history for a certain number of years, and these children, <laughs> these, these students have studied history for, for, you know, for nine, or nine or more years, and they don't know some of these basic facts. That they've, never heard of <coughs> they've never heard of Gladstone or Disraeli, and this, this, uh, this is a worry, and it's, in, and it's a worry that needs addressing, and we have got to together, the profession, <coughs> the policymakers, uh, work out how we're going to solve this problem. The Martin, the you were trying to get it. Yes, the, there is a sort of <coughs> canon, canon of knowledge in, in history and in all sorts of other areas, in you know, mathematics or physics or whatever, that we want all our citizens to, to know. Now, that, that does actually change from time to time, and we have to, have to accept that that it won't always be exactly the same things. I mean, having said <laughs> that, I mean, like, I would equally be, be concerned that there, there are people who don't know that those things. But uh, I think we can probably have it all, of all these arguments, if we unlock the creativity that's actually out there, the teachers that we've already got, so that they can say, well, we'll start from you know, the primary school, the name, of our, the name of our school, we'll do some genealogy. Look how much interest there is in that in the, in the country at the moment. So let's actually go up and that's your great granddad we're looking at and he was in the First World War or whatever and that will, that will give us a, uh, a, a hook to hang some of these things on. So we can do local history, we can do genealogy and we can cover all of those, those things without giving up on the, uh, the, the, you know, those big picture things that, that you're looking for. And at the same time, we can, use, we can develop the skills that we want people to have, weighing evidence. I mean, that's a really useful skill, whatever you end up doing, whether you're studying history or, or being a banker, or for goodness sake. The, uh, being able to do such things is actually so valuable, isn't it? And you can have that as well. OK, we're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, we'll be taking a look at one school which is running counter to the trend in history and asking what teachers can do to stimulate interest in the subject. Welcome back to The Big Debate. Now, according to the stereotype and the surveys, an inner city school should be struggling to get its pupils good GCSE passes in history. But there are some who are beating the odds. History here is extremely popular. We've had uh, you know, exceptionally high uptakes of GCSE and at AS and A2 level. In fact, at all three of those levels, history is the most popular opted for subject. Uh, so, I mean, that's something that we're really proud of. I think it's popular here because we've, we've been able to tailor what we're teaching to best fit the students. Every teacher tries to make it personal to you so you can take individually. What I may get from history here 
may be completely different to what someone else may get from it. Uh, certainly when I was at school, it was a bit of a, at times, a bit of a dry run through events and sort of this tired chronology of events. But actually now, it's a far more exciting, I think it's a far more vibrant subject than it was years ago. Most history teachers know how to engage the class is through anecdote, to know the stories that back up the information that was happening. What tends to happen is that if you engage in a good story and you tell a good story, backed up with the skills that we're going to learn, the students really engage in it, as do most people. Let me go to David Torn. David, you're an award-winning teacher uh, in, in, in Romford. Did, did any of that chime with you in terms of how you get students interested? Yeah, I think certainly the, uh, the passion that was delivered there is, it is about, I mean, going back, not going back, but uh, a moot point is it is about individuals. History is about individuals. And therefore, you, you really have to teach the, to the individual you have in front of you. And I think there's a, there's a big concern, really, about the past Gladstone Disraeli. Actually, um, you need to engage with students, and that's most teachers in every subject do. Um, and every history teacher I've met has actually been enormously passionate about it. And that passion carries through, that enthusiasm carries through. Because something you mentioned earlier was what was the purpose of history, which we haven't actually touched yet. And the purpose of history, surely, is to create the most decent, rounded human beings that we can. So once they should know about people in the past, they should also know about people that have suffered, uh, black, people, black people in America, all sorts. Because at the end of the day, we've got to produce people that are well-rounded and actually are going to be decent citizens. Um, so what I saw there in terms of the passion and actually tailor making it for the students, exactly right. So how, how do we practically do it? Let me bring in David Conway um, from the Civitas think tank. Um, now you, you've got a sort of a, a, a novel idea, if you like, in terms of going back to the past. Tell us about that. Well, um, Civitas republished in 2005 um, an Edwardian children's history of uh, Britain from the Roman conquest to the death of Victoria, uh, written by Henrietta Elizabeth Marshall called Our Island Story. And we did so because we were of the view that um, over recent years there had been a decline uh, among young people in knowledge, basic knowledge of um, key events uh, and an appreciation really of the how our institu major main institutions had evolved over time and what their value was. And this, we felt this would be a very good vehicle um, for introducing them to some of these themes. And we wanted to give, and we still do, free copies to all schools on request. Le Leslie, does, does the idea of our island story fill you with dread? No. It's fine with you? No, I, I got my best marks in British history. I don't have a problem <laughs> with that. <laughs> Uh, I have a problem with the fact that we should be seeing history more as being a cultural archivist, teaching pupils to document, keep diaries, archiving things, starting with their own families themselves, things that are happening outside of their own communities. And that's the, the approach I think it ought to be. It's not about black or white or British or author. It's basically about being archivists. Nick, that's how I see it. Give us a, an indication, because your party's been pretty tough on the teaching of history I in England, and you basically said it is failing and needs to change quite mm. radically. Give us an indication of what you're going to be saying in your first 100 days if you're elected next year. Well, this is what's got to change straight away. We want to get the curriculum slimmed down and simplified. I mean, the, the stuff coming out from the QCA is voluminous. It's it is very prescriptive. It is telling teachers they have to use, they have to take a skills-based approach to teaching history. And to take pick up David's point about social history. Of course, if students had studied 19th century history, they would cover Shaftesbury, and uh, they would cover the Industrial Revolution and, and people starving. They would have covered the Agrarian Revolution. All these things. If you learn that narrative, you do also learn about the social history as well the hidden history you talk about isn't so isn't so hidden when it's studied properly right and, um, and so that's it I mean well, it's about re it's about getting the curriculum uh, slimmed down uh, so that we know and we'll get experts to help write it so that we will know that children when they leave school have a real grasp of the basic history of our country and the basic history of the countries around the world that have influenced our country Lisa do you like the idea of that um, I like the idea but I think it's only really the first step um, I think the most important thing that history gives people 
is, is the ability to refuse, to challenge, to understand that consensus is not the same thing as truth. Um, I think there are all sorts of historical examples in which um, we c for example, let's take, uh, say, Scots nationalism. The idea that this, you know, this is a story about English, you know, the English people colonising Scotland. There's a political party, there's, there's, there's a devolution, there's, there's a whole sort of series of recent historical events which have been based upon this historical narrative. The fact that it's fundamentally wrong, that Robert the Bruce was actually a mercenary who fought for the English, that it was Elizabeth I who defended the rights of the Protestants in 1560 against the um, prospect of a French invasion, is largely forgotten. I mean, that's one instance among great, a great many. I mean, we might consider the example of Margaret Thatcher in the grammar schools as a recent instance of uh, received ideas. Um, I think what, what is taught is obviously extremely important why it's taught is important but in the end what matters is the result and the result should be that students have the right skills to differentiate bias to see what is false and to make up their own minds um let, let me bring in jonathan Howson from the institute of education what's your view on this well i i'm um wondering if we're talking about a number of things and not focusing on one of the main issues i mean certainly we um, should be interested in a narrative of British history. Um, my question is whether we should be talking about skills or if that's a, uh, a, a gross misunderstanding of what is uh, more properly understood as a conceptual approach to history. And we whether we recognize that history has its own standards and that um, if we uh, don't like the stories that we hear, then we have a number of choices. We can either fix the history to, produ to produce the approved story we can get rid of history and call it something else, or we can recognize that history has a much more fundamental and important job to do, because surely the most important thing about uh, learning history is to learn standards of validity and truth about the past, because of what that can contribute to, not individuals within uh, a nation state, but for all of us as human beings to understand what it is to be human, which should be the fundamental role of a history education. Uh, and, and so in practical terms, what does that mean in the classroom? What that means in the classroom is, yes, I would, I would argue that um, a narrative history is important, but not as a chronology simply of events, and not as an exercise in producing uh, endless skills, in, uh, skills exercises in an effort to produce um, um, many historians, but as an exercise in helping kids acquire a usable big picture of their own past, which the gives them some sense as to why they're here in the present and what the future might hold for them. D does, that, does that sound a little bit too much like using history to do something else other than just learn history? No, I think that's very important. That's precisely why uh, our children need to learn history so that they can have a real understanding of the society in which they live. They need to know about the civil war that we had in our country uh, to understand the parliamentary procedures. And you have children coming around the House of Commons who really don't know why we knock on the why the black rod knocks on the door and has his door slammed in his Not face. Not children who don't know about that, nobody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> but you, we all should know about it, about why that is. Krishna, I think there's a, there's a profound difference between the government's position and Nick and the Conservative Party's position, which is, uh, we think that yes, there should be the grounding, uh, that broad, big picture uh, framework, but the teachers, we trust teachers to teach. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, Certainly histor historians, history teachers, give that innovation and can inspire in a way that can really make history come alive and why give the, why that the volume, Why but the volumes of material then from the QCA that's been plunging and landing on teachers' desks all over the country for the last five, six, seven but years? But that's simply not true, Nick. You can't on the one hand say that these, there are volumes of instructions coming down from the QCA and then the other, Michael Gove standing up at the Conservative Party conference and saying we've slimmed down our prescription on the Second World War to the point where Churchill's not mentioned. It's not the case. We are freeing teachers up to teach. We think teachers are best place to be able to give and inspire um, young people in lessons. You don't. You want to control it from Whitehall. That's not that's localism. Tall. Martin, isn't the truth that all politicians talk about freeing up teachers and none of them do it? Well, that's certainly uh, what I was sitting here thinking, that we, 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 we often hear that. I think w what we would like to see is, yes, a slimmer curriculum. Um, the, the, the the curriculum has been overloaded. Far too many things are, are shoehorned in. Uh, and therefore, to give teachers a bit, of, a bit more room for manoeuvre than they've had for 
oh, 25 years. It's not just the present government. The previous Conservative government was also doing the same sort of thing. And when we get into an area like, like this, with the, the same might apply to things like religious education, for example, then we have to tread very warily when we're looking at what the actual content should be. And it, it, there's a real danger that we'll forget that we're educating people for their sake, not for our agenda. Uh, and we, we really need to focus on that uh, and to say to the teachers, here's a, a, a pretty uh, broad brush, a, a, fr a big frame, as it were. There are things that we, we want to see that are there, but that you have a lot of room for manoeuvre within that. Um, at the moment, I think we've had too little. Uh, we're moving in the right direction, yeah, and I think that's right, but I think we, we've got a long way to go yet. I would like to see a lot more room for manoeuvre, past to some of these wonderful teachers that we've seen. But, I mean, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's just quite funny to hear you say we're moving in the right direction, because Nick Gibb and the Conservatives clearly don't think you are. And, th and th there's sort of this consensus, uh, it, it seems, in, in the sort of the teaching community, that you are kind of all doing it, and, 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 and along comes... Michael Gove and Nick Gibb here and says, well, you're not doing it right. If what, we, what, if what we see happen after a Conservative victory in a general election next year is that Nick or, or Michael or whoever comes along and says, well, here's the new list of things you must teach, I don't think that, that will go down terribly well and that won't, really won't do. I'm sure Nick will say, that isn't what you intend to do. I certainly hope that it, that it isn't. I think what we need to be saying is, to, to teachers, here's your professionalism back. Here's your chance to show us that you really can do it really well. Okay, and I think we will find that they can. Let me take a couple of points from before. Gentleman on the front row and, uh, and then behind him. It's not a question of trusting teachers because I think everyone trusts teachers. It's a question of supporting teachers and that's what you haven't been doing for the last 11 years. And that is why the time uh, allocated to history has been allowed to, to, to erode so that it doesn't matter in a sense how good the teacher is in the classroom because there are some superb history teachers out there. But if you have only got the amount of time which you allow heads to squeeze in that way and encourage the, the um, uh, key stage three to go into two years and encourage things like the open minds curriculum to come in with its sort of content free approach to entirely skills based learning in, in, uh, in year nine then it doesn't matter it doesn't matter about a question of, of, of trusting teachers you have let the teachers down that's what's happened and, and yes and next to him um, yeah the only problem is with that is I think teachers have got to take some responsibility as well it, it's not like the government is just telling everybody what to do and everybody does it although it in debates like this it does seem like that I think teachers have accepted in some ways a reduction in their intellectual expectations of what they, ex they, they demand from their students and that, that then that gets compensated Why? for I mean by that's, various that's programs. quite a big claim isn't it? Yeah I, I'm sorry but it's probably uh, what you might call the elephant in the room are we really demanding enough from ourselves as adults uh, intellectually to, in order to demand that from the students that we teach and I, I worry that we don't always. We have to refute the notion that there was somehow a golden age where you could stop a man or a woman on the street and they could recite a list of prime ministers and, and talk about um, Elizabeth I uh, uh, and the Spanish Armada. That might have been true for a very, very narrow elite, something like 4 or 5% of the population. But I think what we're doing now is broadening it out and making, trying to facilitate history coming alive to all of the population, not just the narrow band who were allowed to be able to do this at university 20 years ago. All right, um, I'm going to bring in a final question for the whole panel now from Jeremy Cox. I'd like to ask the panel, history has really inspired uh, lots of young people of today and I'd like to know from the panel who is it in history that might inspire you? Martin. I think I would choose Darwin. I'm not a history teacher, I'm actually a maths teacher and uh, I, I'm uh, very, very turned on by the history of in intellect, if you like, by that scientific revolution. Uh, I could have said Newton uh, and uh, perhaps that would have been closer to, uh, uh, to my mathematical origin but uh, Darwin's in the, uh, uh, in the ether this, uh, this year, so I'll go for Darwin. Nick, who's your uh, historical role model? Well, predictably, uh, Winston Churchill. Not, not because he... You always say that. No, not because, the Albert, not because he won the war. <laughs> not because he won the war for, for, for this country, but because in the years before the war, he stood up, stood out against the prevailing ethos, the prevailing consensus. And I think, you know, as politicians, Ian and I, I'm sure we both hope that we would do that if the time came. 
Leslie. Mansa Musa, the Muslim king of Mali, who in this time was thought of as being the most richest man and presided over uni great universities in Africa. And Lisa? I think I would say collectively the women of the suffragette movement. Why? Because uh, they got me the vote, possibly. <laughs> and Ian Wright? Um, I admire people, individuals who changed the political weather. Um, who stood up in the face of adversity and criticism. And so, just off the top of my head, and history is so vast and diverse and exciting to name a, an individual, but the likes of Wilberforce, the likes of David Lloyd George, who could really make a difference, um, they're inspirational. Well, thank you all very much indeed. That's it for this edition of The Big Debate. Just remains for me to thank our panel, Ian Wright, Lisa Hilton, Leslie Willis, Nick Gibb, and Martin Ward, and as well as our audience here. But for me and all the team here, bye-bye.